I love punk rock. <laughs> Actually, so that song is a Greg song because not only is he a super talented designer, artist, and everything, he's also a great punk rock musician. And right now he's doing sludge metal. So if you don't know who uh, Greg is, he's an artist, writer, designer, um, all around super cool, nice person. Totally sycophantic, right? And um, he's also uh, has worked on you know, these huge blockbuster movies like Lord of the Rings and King Kong and Godzilla and my personal favorite, District 9, as you know. And um, then he decided to make the leap into gaming with his uh, first title, which is Dr. Gordbort's Invaders, which you saw a clip of. But that clip, absolutely, it's so, I played it the other, the other day and oh my God, it's so amazing. It's like being in maybe Star Trek's holodeck or something without the holodeck part. Yeah, the, the intention was to make you feel like you were the action hero in your own game or like the game was happening. And I you. was, because I was talking to the robots. It's like, oh yeah, take that. Anyway, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to talk to Greg about sort of like his history and how he came to making the games. So, uh, you know, you have, a, you have a band, Ghidorah. Ghidorah. Ghidorah, see? Ghidorah, <laughs> Ghidorah. It's like tomato, tomato, whatever. Um, so, so you left school, and instead of going into gaming or to concept art, you just decided that you were going to hang out on the dole, which is unemployment, and <laughs> yeah. do nothing. So, so I, New Zealand, just for a little bit of context, I suppose, New Zealand is a relatively small place. It's uh, four and a half million. Actually, probably a few more than that now. Five million, six million, I don't know. But it's not very big. Uh, and it's at the arse end of the world. We're down at the bottom of the, of the Pacific. Um, and there's, growing up, I knew there wasn't any jobs for creatives. So, like, you know, there, you couldn't go out and be a comic artist or a video game artist really? or anything like that. No, there just wasn't anything of that sort of, of that type. Uh, and really, it wasn't until Peter Jackson and Richard Taylor uh, formed Weta and then started making those films that a lot of us growing up were like, oh, th there's like, there's a creative opportunity here. Um, and so, but like, yeah, for my entire life, it was like, no, I, I, I joined the doll because there was no other option. Like, a, like yeah, yeah, I yeah. ran out of, I got to the end of school and I'm, I'm living in a small town, you know, with a few thousand people. So it's like, well, I go on the unemployment benefit. That's just what, what you did. But That's what me and my, all my friends did. Yeah, yeah. So did that make you have, you know, a little bit more time to be creative because you weren't, you know, slaving away at some other thing? Yeah. So, I mean... My entire life been obsessed with imagination and obsessed with coming up with ideas, fictions, worlds, characters, and then bringing them to life. And so the only means I had of doing that was illustrating, making comics. And so that's what I did all the time. And then, of course, later on, music. I think I, I, uh, about the age of 17 or 18, I got obsessed with music. And so actually at that time, I completely turned my lens from making artwork. This is some of my pictures, yeah, by so, the way. So this is his work. It, his stuff is amazing, it's really creative. And were you working on this when you were yeah, young? So I, I always wondered, like, is Dr. Gordboard been in your head for weird, ages? I was doing weird punk rock comic books and, and just like generally, re and realizing, you know, like, so I would, what I'd do is you make a comic book and then you, you photocopy 20 copies, because that's what yeah, you yeah, can yeah. afford, and then you staple them together, and then you take them to the local comic shop and they sell them for 50 cents a piece. Right. And then you take the five dollars you earned, or whatever it is. Yeah, yeah, go I can't do maths clearly. I didn't you go down the through. pub, right? But, um, yeah, yeah, so uh, <laughs> you just got used to living on the dole and living on nothing, you know? Yeah. Back, back at that time in my life, we were making music, drawing comics, but you'd get five, six, seven, or eight people and you'd find the cheapest place in town and you all just live there and, right, um, and right, just right. try and get by. Um, so you see this, this artwork here? So Greg was actually rejected at art school. How, how is that possible? Like yeah, I you, don't know. you turn in your portfolio and they're like, this is crap. I mean, how could that even happen? <laughs> it must have been crap. But, um, <laughs> I'm sure it wasn't. I, I guess like, I mean, I, I, there wasn't any options. There wasn't a place to go study comics or video games or any of that kind of stuff. There was an art school, Elam. And so I sent my folio in there, you know, and that's modern art. And that's like, to me, was baffling. So I, I don't know. I drew a bunch of really weird messed up shit, because that's but what I thought still, art was. You still draw a bunch of weird yeah, messed up shit. That's yeah, that's actually true. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, um, but no, they rejected me, and then um, another course rejected me, and I ended up doing like a sort of tech, polytech kind of technical thing to learn sign writing. Um, and, uh, really? And yeah, I did that for a little while. That and, um, surprises me. And then eventually I got kicked off the dole, because once you're on the dole for long yeah. enough, I was on the dole for about seven years. Uh, and me and all my friends were, but if you're on there, over there for that long, you'll get your own caseworker, and that caseworker <laughs> makes your life a misery. 
And uh, I could not do enough to make her happy. She was always pushing, you know, I, I couldn't find a decent, yeah, real job. Okay, yeah, so they pushed you so far that you wound up at Weta. Yeah. Weta Workshop. Do well, you guys know who that is? It's like they did all the Lord of the Rings movies. Uh, Richard Taylor was the founder. He is amazing. So I think she did you a favor. Oh, she did. She was a total dickhead, but she totally did me a favor. So, um, how yes. did you wind up at work? So, uh, I, you know, if, if you've got no money and you get kicked off the dole and you know you're going to spend the next year of your life not, not like, I was trying to figure... Like, Sheep farming. Well, I was going to go live under a bridge, you know, because I was <laughs> like at that point, like, what do I do next? And um, uh, what I actually decided to do was me, me and my partner, Kate, we moved, put our stuff in our car, and we drove to Wellington, an even more expensive city than where I was yeah, living, yeah, yeah. Um, which is a very stupid idea. Um, that was a great idea, looking back. <laughs> and it, it was about that time. I was there for a little while. I was slowly selling everything I owned that I could sell. Uh, well, any musical equipment or guitars I bought over the years, I would sell all that, and then was sort of eking all my way along like that. Um, and then Lord of the Rings came out. Which was amazing. I love that. I love that, that, that was, so much. That was an utter revelation. And that's, yeah. to me, the moment that changed my life when I realized, oh, there must be people in this town that are imagining yeah, those things, right, that are on that screen. Yeah, right. So um, I drew a bunch of, actually, I drew the things I love to do. I pro if I was sensible, I would have drawn goblins and orcs and elves. But um, I, um, I drew dinosaurs and robots because that's what I loved. But, and ray guns. But Sir Richard Taylor? He loved that stuff. He's yeah. been like such a huge fan of yours. Yeah, I sent and it he's in. he's the founder of Weta. And uh, very luckily for me, he liked my moxie. And I think what was happening is they were starting, about to start King Kong in another movie called Evangelion, which is a, was a live action version yeah, of yeah, uh, it was Japanese a comic anime. First, right? And so it was just right time, right place, you know, and um, got very lucky and got a job out of it. And then I just, at that point, I thought, I won't have a job here for more than a week. So I'm just <laughs> going to go a million miles an hour um, and do as much as I possibly can, you know, and see how far I can go with it. So, for the audience, can you just tell them some of the, some of the big blockbuster movies that you've worked on? Well, you mentioned them. Co King Kong, which was really fun. Well, for you, because you're... I'm a dinosaur you know, person. Yeah, I love exactly. dinosaurs. Um, and so that was, that was a and total treat. And getting to work with Peter uh, on that, like, you know, he, he's got a colossal imagination, so that was fun. Uh, and Godzilla. Then Godzilla. I, I, I selfishly worked on Godzilla. I can't take any credit for anything that's in those films. No, but I, you love Godzilla. I, someone, we were, Richard said we're working on Godzilla, and I'm like, okay, I'll do some pictures <laughs> I'll of do Godzilla. It for free. I'll, I will do it for free. <laughs> I didn't say that. But, but um, um, no, I, uh, and then District 9, which was really, I, uh, that was where we met Neil Blomkamp. We were actually working on the Halo feature film. Oh, and, right, uh, Halo, and that got canceled, and yeah. then did District 9 instead? Yeah, and that really, that, Again, that, that was a chance for, it was actually a great thing because I loved Halo, I'm a video gamer, yeah, that's yeah, what yeah. I do in my spare time. Um, but he plays Tetris in his spare time. Really. <laughs> on the toilet. A uh, joke. <laughs> but um, he, I, what was I going to say? That film, I was sort of reinventing some, not reinventing, but taking someone else's fiction and, and then putting my own, you know, um, little, little something, something over top of it. But really, what you want to do as an artist, as a creative, is invent your own world. So with District 9, I have suddenly had a much better opportunity to that, because Neil uh, and I connected really quickly, and then we could sort of invent that world together. I, he, I, actually, I shouldn't take too much credit. He invented that world. I put cool robots and, uh, and things in it. Um, when I saw it, I, could, I noticed your work. I was like, oh, that looks like Greg's, yeah. Greg's but, weapons. But in the meantime, I'm developing this science fiction world that you see here, the world of Dr. Gro Dr. Grodbots, and that was my own my own uh, sort of take on the, the fact that I was inspired by like science fiction of the 1920s and 1930s. I, I grew up watching uh, Flash Gordon and Buck Rogers in black and white when I didn't know that black and white was not modern. You know, I just mm -hmm. they were just like amazing to me when I was six years old. So I grew up with that fiction and thought and, and, and wanted to pay out on that. I wanted to have and I wanted to take a satirical take on it. The idea was that Britain, colonial Britain, had gone into space and was basically um, settling, co colonizing the rest of our solar system. And v Venus was kind of a surrogate for, uh, a st stand in for, uh, for India or Africa. Right, so it's right. really just a metaphor about any power group, you know, like going out and stamping its culture across yeah, the Lord rest of the Lord Coxwain, world. he's a horrible person. Yeah, uh, that, that's, <laughs> an, I think, a strange thing about the fiction and maybe a unique thing to maybe some people from New Zealand, South Africa, England, Australia. Like, I wrote a story about bad people, <laughs> where the bad people are the main characters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because to me, that makes sense. I grew up with a lot of comedy like that, you know? And there's a lot of heart and love in those stories, but they come from a satirical place where you're actually talking about bad people doing bad things. Um, and I, I find that really interesting. Uh, and I find it much more satisfying than 
uh, than simple heroic tales of everyone doing the right thing, where all right. the bad guys get their comeuppance and all the good guys get what they, de what they deserve. Because Well, yeah, well, there's a place for that, but it's just not what excites me. Uh, but through that relation, through that the time, there eventually, um, Roni Ab Abovitz uh, is the CEO of Magic Leap. He, um, he was actually in touch with us developing his own creative project called The Hour Blue. It was a very cool kind of science fiction world that he was imagining. He'd come out of uh, medical robotics and was um, doing amazing motion control bone surgery. And then he decided, wow. okay, I'm do what I'm doing next is I'm doing creative. So he came to Weta Workshop um, and started developing that world. And then he met me along the way and, um, and then told me one day, this is about seven and a half years ago now, said, okay, I, I love the world of Dr. Grobots. Wouldn't it be cool if your characters could exist in your world with you, like you could meet Lord Coxwain, and you'd look down at your hand and you have a ray gun, and you could have a battle in your living room. I love those ray guns. And you, you know, so I'm gonna make these goggles, well, we better do that. Would you like to make Dr. Grobots on that platform? And I'm like, yes, of course I would. Right, that's the, that's the best offer, I've, creative offer I've ever had in my life. But I also didn't think it was possible. Like, cast your minds back seven years ago, uh, this is before the current VR explosion and, and, and other, every other thing that's happening now, this started to become normal. But there was like the telling a young artist that you could take your imagination and put it in a more literal way, spatially in the world, and have people experience it in a more one-to-one -one way, that didn't make any sense. So I, I actually went to Florida thinking, this is nonsense, but I want to find out how crazy these people actually are, right? Because that'll be entertaining unto itself. Just, but it, as it turns out, you know, I met utterly, utterly brilliant people. The first yeah. person I met coming off the plane was this guy, Sam Miller, uh, who is the chief systems architect for Magic Leap. I think there was a photo of him earlier, and he looked like he was from NASA. And it turns out he was from NASA. Yeah, I like, what do you it. do? I, I helped dock NASA. payloads with, of the ISS, you know, using um, machine vision. I'm like, really? Okay, though, so you know what you're talking That's about. That's amazing. And every single person I talked to at Magic Leap was like that. In this weird place in Fort Lauderdale in Florida, where the heat is oppressive and there's yeah. iguanas rolling and running around on the ground, on the, in the parking lot. It's like, this is where the future is being built. And it's like, okay, shit, I'm, I'm in. You know, like, I, I wanna, my whole quest, if you like, is to take imagination and realize it somehow, to bring it in the world so people can live in a story. And then I've done that through comics and I've done that through films and so on. And those, those are all amazing, but like, to have that opportunity to do it in the real world so it feels one-to-one, -one, like, that, it still blows my mind when I'm thinking about it now. The so, like we've only just cracked open the door of that. But so this is so this is so you, okay? If you look at if you look at these pictures, so this is Magic Leap when when they first started working on it. So here is a you know uh, an artist that's doing writing and uh, doing all these things in the film world, and yeah, you want to make a game, not, not the Xbox not the PlayStation, something that the technology doesn't even exist, <laughs> and you had never made a game before. The only thing, was it with the Cow Muncher I, 5000? I always call it that, I, I know I have the name wrong, but I, you, yeah, did, did, you did some weapons for Valve, right? For TF2, right? for Valve, yeah. So, I was so really just trying to figure out how do you make video games, because like I said, I came from a background of no technical expertise. Yeah, so... Um, so and, but I just love video games, and I figure out, like, well, I, I just want to make one. I don't know how you make them, I don't know uh, how you do any of that technical stuff, but like, you know, I'm only alive once, so I'll figure it out, you know? Yeah, that's very it, punk rock. Is that your punk rock, like, DIY background, where it's like, you know what, we'll just do it? Yeah, I, I, I don't know, it's just like, uh, the, the alternative was not doing it, so. <laughs> I guess yeah, I chose yeah, yeah, to yeah. do it. So, seven years you're, you worked on Dr. Yeah. Bloodport's Invader. And so seven I, years is huge I started building this team, uh, that you see, it actually some, this is Graham Devine, who was uh -huh. one of our uh, uh, great video game maker that helped to guide us. But I started building this team, and to be honest, that's the biggest thing that I had to learn, was not the technicalities of making a game, which are obviously really fun and really interesting, and delve into psychology and um, a million interesting things. But really just learning, uh, going from myself being a one-person artist where I, I make everything on the page. Like in my, my original books, I wrote every word, I drew every picture, I laid everything out. You know, that, that's the way I would do it. And I slowly accrete a little bit of help to help me mm -hmm. fast track that. You have but to trust to, the people you're working to with. To transfer right? to like yeah. the mode of like now I, I need to trust people who clearly know way more than I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like a higher clever people to, to do things that I can only imagine. And then they, uh, that's been the, the challenge and the inspiring part. So can you tell us about when you started at, at Magic Leap and they said, okay, we're gonna do this thing. And, and basically, if you haven't played the game, these portals open up on the wall and it's all augmented reality. So you, you map, or spatial computing. Mm. So you map the room and then the room gets mapped and then, and then 
you know, things come out at you. And, you know, I was playing it and, and I was blown away. And one of the things I was really blown away was by the objects. You know, these robots are coming out, and I'm like, oh my god, that's so cool. I really want to see the detail in that. So I got killed a few times, whatever. <laughs> but, um, you know, tell us about the journey be before, like, I've been hearing about Magic Leap for so long, and at one point I was like, does this company really exist? Are they actually mm. doing something? So I think that's the general attitude still of the world at the moment. <laughs> it's, it's nice to be here in a place where people realize this technology is here now, and it's usable now, but I don't think anyone quite is getting wrapping their head around it. Uh, how massive it's going to be. But tell and in us the about general world, the, the attitude is, of course, like it, it doesn't exist. It's still, I still have people commenting that it's like vaporware. It's like we released well, our game I, six months know, ago. But, but before I actually saw it, like six months or a year, yeah, yeah. or however long ago when it came out, I was like, yeah, is this, is this the Duke Nukem 2 or whatever that, you oh, know, that yeah, game yeah, that yeah, never Duke came Duke out? Forever. It was like, you know, so, so how advanced was the technology when you started? So when we started, and this is probably showing you how naive and silly I am really, there was no technology, there were just <laughs> okay. people. It was Roni, who's a visionary and clearly smart. His previous like, company, like I say, was medical robotics, motion controlled bone surgery. That's um, amazing, so by the way. he is a visionary and has that, um, that technical um, ability to see where you can go. Um, and the people around him, Randall, uh, Sam, they were just brilliant technically. And, I, and every single question I asked, I'm not a layman, I'm not a, really a technical person. I would ask them everything that I think, like, you can't do it because of X. Like, how are we going to solve X? Mm. They would have some conjecture, some really good conjecture, some ideas. We could go down this avenue, we could go down this avenue. Technical. Technical okay. answers. And, uh, and that's what gave me the faith. But there really was nothing. There was, like, some white papers. Um, I think when I came back six months uh, into the process, I came back to Florida, I got to see what was called, we called the, big, the beast or the bench top. It was a massive light field display that was in this, uh, s these offices in Florida in a, you know, in a back lot, um, stuck to the table. It was m s just this colossal piece of machinery to put your chin down on a specific point and lean in and look through these tiny, tiny little Oh, and lenses. that's how you saw what was being And you would see on. a light field, and I would see an object situated in a space, and, uh, and that that was, um, that, like I said, I was already in by that, that point, but that was the out, revelation, right? like, oh, okay, like that's, I don't know how we're going to take this giant aluminium frame and make it so you can fit on your head, but like that's yeah, someone yeah. How else's did you go job. From this, like, okay, you know, it's like a but vast, I, I saw the, computer. Yeah, I saw the future in that moment. I saw virtual things floating in the world that I believed, and that, and of course, the rest of it is just a lot of hard uh, work and graft. It's you know? really amazing, and uh, Magic Leap, it's off Dr. Gordbort, but they also have like this aquarium. And you know, I was looking down, I was like, oh my God, there's coral. And that fish, the fish played with me. I was like, hi, dude. You know, like it's so interactive. Um, so, you know, the thing is, is that you know these characters, you know, back and forth. Um, and y I'm sure you love them all, even though Lord Coxwain's a Love them and hate them. Yeah, you know. Um, so how, how do you get in a, in a shooter game? Because it's, what would you, would you describe it? Like open so world I think it was an action game, like but you get a, you get a ray gun. So, but, but how do you translate um, those kind of characters into into a game that's a shooter. You know, when it, before it was narrative. Yeah. So there is a narrative in there. I really. So the, the game really opens with. Um, so of course you start. You scan your environment. Uh -huh. and we try and do it in a way that hopefully you don't even know that you've scanned your environment. I love that how it mapped everything. I thought that was. But as cool. soon as our game. And this is a little gimbal here on the screen. Oh yeah, yeah, him. As soon as little gimbal. As soon as we find a surface, you know, we're like, okay, gimbal. There's a doorway, and we look for one with, that you're looking at mm -hmm. at the right time. And there's a ton of little tricks like that you know, where we're like, you're trying to stage a little play in the person's home trying to find commonalities across everyone's homes, so it's, it'll play in as many people's homes as possible, in theory. And then you're inventing a ton of little tricks to go like, okay, I want this character to come in next. How is that going to happen? How am I going to lead the viewer to look at that thing uh, right. at the right time and make it feel like there's a, a, there's a narrative happening? Because to be honest, like Magic Leap, across Magic Leap, we did a ton of demos that were all bespoke, right? Where like we situate all the things in just the right places and get it just so. And then you can bring someone in and you show them demo and it, and it works. And as long as they're looking at the right place at the right time, it works. And there's a, it's really straightforward to do that, to be honest. The hard part is in making it dynamic so that it reacts to your space, but more importantly, to the individual. So uh, it, it, it's, like, it's like you're in the story. That's the whole goal. Yeah, well, it's very intuitive because, you know, I, play the Xbox and the PlayStation, all that, you know, I hate, but I hate button mashing. So you just have like this little, you know, it's this little controller. I couldn't believe how small the CPU or, you know, yeah. the little pack is that you put on your, uh, you know, you put in your pocket and then the glasses, 
they're not that heavy at all. I mean, no. I'm, you know, when you see the big VR ones, but I mean, it was, it was really nice that when I, when I played it, I could just, you know, pick up an object like yeah. I would in real life. And then there's a shield that you have, and it's just your hand as a shield. So I mean, that's something we really, I really cared about was about UI and UX in general. Making it, I, don't, I didn't want to have menus with things to yeah, select. Yeah, it's so boring. I didn't, want you to, I didn't want you to use your thumb to select around things. I wanted you to like learn, use the abilities we learn when we're like six months old, right? right. Which is you, you look up at mum uh, and right, and you look at her, and then you then you learn to reach, and mum gives you something, and you reach out for it. It's like just obey all those things we learned as toddlers. But so like, how did so you, you get Gimbal turns up and he wants to give you something. And how do you, we do have this moment, especially with older people when they play the game for the first time, because we've grown up on computers, on flat yeah, screens, yeah. we'll say to people like, uh, pick up the ray gun. And they'll go like, they'll look at the controller, <laughs> like which is the pick up the ray gun button, right? And then they'll stand there fixed in place. That's totally what I did. Yeah. I was like, but how do I get the spark plug? Kids I don't, don't do it. this. Like no, kids, it's kids intuitive. just walk over to Gimbal and reach their hand in and suddenly they've got, they've got whatever he was gonna give them. Um, and so you just treat it like that. But weirdly enough, like I say, for kids, it's, it's, it's trivial. Yeah, yeah. For adults, we've like, spent the last 30, 40 years teaching that ourselves way. how to operate, like slide your finger around on a thing yeah, or yeah. use this mouse to do this. So but you've got to sort of untrain that stuff. But was that hard to like, come up with that technology to make it so easy? Because anything simple is usually really hard. It is. That it looks simple. Everything was excruciatingly hard. <laughs> it's <laughs> definitely the hardest creative thing I've ever done in my life from, by orders of magnitude. Like going from there was no medium yeah. to inventing a game on that medium. It's, it was That's brutal. That's crazy. It's and, crazy. The, and the hardest part of it is just trying to keep a team, a growing team, like on the same page and going, no, no, we're going to ship this thing and it's going to be fucking amazing. You know? And it was, but that was yeah, the thing. Like people are like, everyone's looking at each other now and then going like, is this thing going to work? You know? Especially well, you try and convince people this massive thing that sits on top of a desk that that's going to be wearable. A lot of people are just like, nah, I don't think it is. Yeah, yeah. When I saw it, I was like, really? But, yeah. you know, it's like... Actually, I think my first thought was like, oh my God, help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi. You're my only, you know, in Star Wars, when Princess yeah. Leia comes out, it was totally like that. I was like, oh, wow. That, and that's why Gimbal is there to give you like this, he's a robot, but who's, give you this, Gimbal is a, that's Reese Darby. Okay. The comedian, I really, I really, really like him. He was on Flight of the Conquest. Yeah, I was going to say Flight of the He's a Kiwi Conquest, comedian yeah, yeah. and he's just su such a funny dude. And I, he has that very approachable, like you think he's a bit of an idiot, you know, in the, in, in the, in the <laughs> Flight of the Conquest. And I wanted this sort of neurotic, friendly little person yeah, yeah. to greet you as you came in. Because you're, the whole, this whole environment of a game that happens in your world with you is as strange to you, right? And people do, like, how do I do anything? So I wanted you to have a friend that, yeah. would, that would lead you into it. Yeah, yeah, I kept saying, thanks, man. <laughs> yeah. So um, the other thing I wanted to ask you about is like, okay, so right now it's a, it's a single player game. I'm sure mm. that was a, you know, just coming up with a single that was, player that game was, a was choice. quite difficult. Yeah, because it was hard enough making a game at all. And how did you uh, make the headset so small? Oh, that's, you have to ask the people at Magic Leap for that. But it's crazy, that. right? I know, it is crazy. Uh, it, there's these great pictures of you with like this, looks like construction yeah, yeah. only, only really bad construction because <laughs> it's so huge. Um, yeah, we would, we would wear those devices, they, they weighed a ton. They had a massive sure. cable going off to a PC, so you would like, we could only move like two meters. Did you ever have anything like, oh my God, this isn't going to work? Or I, just like, I'm, I'm going to make it work. I'm a massive optimist. And yeah, and like I would, uh, so I would go to Florida probably uh -huh. six to eight times a year. And if I ever had any doubts, that's where I'd get them all reaffirmed, is go and talk yeah. to Roni, go and talk yeah. to the geniuses there making the right. stuff and realize that, oh my God, like they, they are solving all the problems. And you realize how Herculeanly, <laughs> that's not a word, how hard no, the challenges her are. No. Um, uh, not when I added E to the end, that wasn't a all word. All right, whatever. I stopped it being Don't a word. Be so the, um, the Pedantic. Word. Yep, that's what I am. <laughs> but seeing, the, seeing that, seeing, testing out the latest stuff, that would like you ground me again. But then that was my challenge. I, I have to go back to New Zealand and reinstill in the rest of our team that like this is, it's gonna this, work. this shit yeah, is working, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's gonna happen. So it's single player. So you you know you go in your room, you map your living room, you play. It's so fun. If you can, if you guys can get a hold of Magic Leap and, and play it, you will have so much fun. So, but fun level two mm. is that um, it's not out yet, but um, they sort of taken around. So it's multiplayer. Mm. So you play with your friends in the same room. Yeah. So we're making a multiplayer game right now, and actually it came out of 
uh, almost technical need. Like, so when I was making this game, and I'm doing a review with our team, I have the headset on, and I'm looking at Dr. Grodboard here, you know, and I've got everyone else in the team, like the producer and whoever, maybe the animator, let's say it's the animator, uh, and they're and I'm saying, like, but this bit here to the right, like, his animation is a little bit whatever, you know, like, and they're all standing there watching me like I'm a crazy person, like, you know, but like, you what are am a I? Crazy person, oh, that's true. Same. But I'm pointing at a thing that doesn't exist, so we're all fighting trying to take, talk about the same things in the same context. It's, it, it's incredibly hard. So we realized, like, in the future, we've got to solve this. So you did it for We've got to make things reasons? multiplayer. We'll make it multiplayer from the ground up. Then we'll all be able to put a device on. We'll all look at the same things at the same time. And, of course, you instantly discover that it's way more fun. But also, that, way that, harder. <laughs> like, there's now uh, an exponential more, m number more failure points that can happen. But that like was just for a, devel a development reason It was a development re out? need, yeah. We knew oh, okay. it would be fun, but, like, I, I like single-player games Mostly, I'm that sort of person. I like, I like disappearing into a book. I like disappearing into a fiction, a single-player fiction. I like that's where my, uh, my passion is, uh, and I do like multiplayer games. But it was really a technical need. Like Jimmy Beard, our lead designer, you know, was like, we should just make everything multiplayer. And I'm like, well, I love but multiplayer. He, it's he more just, social. It's more fun for me. He just went away and uh, with Tom Hall, our, one of our lead programmers, and made a multiplayer demo and. Instantly, it was like, oh, yeah, of course. We, this, is, this is what we should be doing. That makes total sense. Yeah, it makes it's sense. not only solves our creative problems, it, it makes us work faster, but it's just more fun. And now you're not one crazy person standing in a room seeing, seeing like, <laughs> the future. You're two crazy people in the room, and then three crazy people. I think it'd be quite so fun on. to watch, right? People probably bump into each other and uh, fall yeah. over. But now, now we have those art reviews, uh, and it's everyone in the team all looking at the same things. And that turned into our first game, uh, multiplayer game, which we're working on at the moment, which uh, it plays on a theme that I've been thinking of since the start of Magic Leap, wh where I thought, so what's going to happen, right, is we all wear clothes that express ourselves, right, and we do things online that are extensions of that expression. Right. What's going to happen with this technology is we're going to become our digital selves, like in the way we, like the clothes avatar. we wear, the things yeah. we, yeah, we're like already avatar. doing that via our phones and so on, with Snapchat yeah. and so on. Uh, but that's just going to become us. Like the silver jumpsuits of um, old fashioned sci-fi, that may well be true, right? UFO, because remember that show? Oh your God. clothes will be digital, and not just your clothes, but like it, whatever expression of you you can possibly imagine. So, but well, so and I, so that's what I, we did in our game: was we give you a mask, we give you become a character, uh, and then so because the magic leap uh, is uh, tracking your eyes, we express that back onto the character. Now the character is looking the same way as you, and when you talk, your character talks, um, and so and then we allow, we thought like, well, let let people dress each other up. Uh, now we have cosmetics in the game, so people can spend a little while just kind of literally dressing each other. They like take lipstick and then draw on each other's faces and put a moustache on or really? put a ponytail on or earrings or, you know, like, uh, and kind of go crazy with that side just of things. For, just for, like, you, just can, you can make your friends really mad. Yeah, yeah, and that is a, that is a whole other issue of how not <laughs> All right, to look, make your friends mad. We have 32 seconds left, so oh, wow. we're going to have to wrap this up. But um, So tell, tell me what's next, what, what project you're working on next. So... Actually, what I'm, I'm really excited about our multiplayer game, but I'm massively excited about a tool we're making uh, that we call Mug internally. It's a, um, a multi-user gallery. And basically, it's a multi, like I said, it's that multiplayer feature, and it's an ability for us to all load up our art and our assets and all stand around and share them and look at them at the same time. Uh, it's really just a super fast, super easy 3D visualization tool. And we already found it uh, really helpful in filmmaking. So we we'll yeah, might have a film client come in and we're like, do you want to see the giant dinosaur that you're in And you, you do in that movie? with Weta. Yeah, like, so, so now we can working stand on. it in the room, right, and look at it. And then if we want to make any changes, we make some changes and boom, and there it goes. Uh, and to me, that is, a, is just a, a colossally important thing for us because it's going to fast track our development. But the extensions of it are, are really quite amazing, right? It's just being able to... Uh, populate 3D content easily in the world and, and then trigger animations, trigger various bits of logic and so on from there. Um, so that thing that we're making, I, I, I almost want to play in that more than anything else because uh, I just get to load up bits of art and audio and particle effects and uh, animations and just kind of revel in them and see that artistry. It's, it's one of my favorite parts of my day is just putting on that headset and, and talking with all the other, other artists about what we're making and looking at it. Yeah, that's amazing. So I really wish we had more time to talk. Um, we'll have to come back next time. Yeah. So thank you all for coming, and uh, you know, go check out the game because it's really fun. So thanks. Thank you. Yeah, and if you. <laughs> all right. Yeah.
Sorry, Greg, I totally cut you off. Oh, cool. Thank you very much. If you see me around, please come by and say hello. Bye. Cheers. Enjoy the rest of your conference.